The way out of it is for the people to take back the power, and the people have to take back the power by taking action. That's kind of taboo that you should not talk about money. But I think it's the most important thing that we all learn about money, we all learn about how to make money, and we start embracing that money is important. 90% of the population is always on the wrong side of the trade, and 10% is on the right side of the trade. So when the stock is overvalued, when it's gone up a lot, typically that's when 90% of the population jumps into the stock. And if you don't invest in cryptocurrency, I think you will in the future. So everyone should have chickens. Everyone should have chickens. Hello, here in Puerto Escondido with good friend Mike. Known him for eight six years. years, six years, six years now. It's a lot of good ideas about investing. He's the one who got me into cryptocurrency to start with. Uh, lives kind of a unique life I do. in normal American terms. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, talk a little about globalization, the bad word. And then I kind of like what you were talking about with Soto about uh, getting out of the cities. I think that's a new perspective. I think a lot of people are towards cities. And you're saying that it should be the opposite. Yeah, I think, I think as a society, you develop power when you can be self-sustainable, and that means monetarily and food. If you have your own food and you have your own source of wealth, then you no longer have to worry about politics or what happened. You, you just develop a stronger society that way. And that means moving out of the city. Why does that mean moving out of the city? Well, when you live in the city, you're dependent on lots of conditions. What and the conditions are whether the crops are good, whether people can manufacture the crops. Uh, a lot of food has to be transported into the cities, and the, the larger the cities grow, the larger the transportation of the uh, food and all the things that you need have to be mass produced in order to, to sustain larger and larger cities. So as cities grow, the demand for on the environment and you know raw materials grows. If we all spread out and live, then you, then, then you utilize less materials, less transportation, less, you know, you build up, each individual becomes more sustainable and stronger because when you have a massive distribution, each individual, the person in charge of the distribution becomes more and more wealthy by the proportion. Many, many, many people in charge of local distributions, then you have wealth scattered out throughout the, throughout the, well, city, state, country, globe. So it's a global phenomenon, not just a country phenomenon. So how could the, how could someone who lives in a city become more self-sustained, as you say, which would empower the individual as opposed to empowering the system? Okay, yeah, so the most important thing is, comes down to having your financial um, financial situation in order. If you're in debt, try to get out of debt. If you're buying stuff that you don't need, limit that because when you have money, you can make money. And if you don't have money, you're stuck in this situation where you're living paycheck to paycheck and, and you just, you can't live a free lifestyle. So. We're never taught this in schools. It's, it's something that's kind of taboo that you should not talk about money. But I think it's the most important thing that we all learn about money. We all learn about how to make money. And we start embracing that money is important because if, if each individual has their own wealth and they can sustain themselves for a year without having to go to work, then, you, then your, your sense of freedom and your sense of peace grows astronomically because you're not as fearful and there's really two things in life it's love and fear and if, if we can limit fear by um, having a sense of security then we can work more on love so, so you, you live differently than most people in the city because you live I don't know, in this, Rochester which is a, a small city in of itself but you live on the outskirts of that what could okay so you what do you do that empowers you 
that an average city, that someone who lives in a city couldn't do? Well, I think anybody in the city can do it as well. Um, you can grow your own, grow your own food. I think, obviously, that's something that most people don't want to touch. But it's really empowering to, to develop something from nothing. So plants are here, and animal, and animals, humans are animals. Animals are there to um, make plants useful. So if we can grow our own produce as individuals and maybe raise some livestock, I don't know if you can do that in the cities, but I think in most cities you can grow, you can have a couple chickens and... Everyone should have chickens. Everyone should have chickens. Uh, what else? Um, so what's your take on cryptocurrency in its current state? I think cryptocurrencies, I'm not a financial advisor, um, but they're going to revolutionize the whole planet. And if you don't invest in cryptocurrency, I think you will in the future. So it's kind of like the early movers, you know, are going to benefit the most. And I think everybody should at least understand cryptocurrency. So I'm mostly... Uh, it's still early. It's still early, very early. I think most people don't adapt soon enough. And we are um, we're living in a world where if you can adapt the quickest, or you're the first to adapt, you're going to benefit the most. So we've always, in the past, it's always been the developing and from grabbing something that already exists and building it up. But now it's a mad dash to change. We're always changing, 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 and the time is going faster. So if you're the first person to adapt to something new, you can create your own, you can be extraordinarily wealthy if you're the first mover. So, yeah, I agree, but so that first move, obviously people saw tremendous growth in Bitcoin, for instance, but now it's come back down. So should I have adapted out of it? Should I have been quick to adapt out of it and didn't recognize the signs? Well, no one can ever time the markets. The great, some people can well because they, they're good at, they have a good financial understanding of economics and trading. Uh, Warren Buffett, per se, like he always seems to be in the, on the right side of the market, but he's very conservative. So I think it's important to be conservative but also take risk. But understand that the most important thing is your education. So if you can find the right books to read and read them and, and spend the time, your, your life will grow astronomically if you can understand finances. And it's rewarding to, it's rewarding to grow as a person. So what are some books? I some think I know books. this answer, but uh, what are the books you recommend? Number one is The Richest Man in Babylon. Yeah, he just gifted me. It is uh, crucial that every individual understands this book. And it's cheap, quick, easy read. Definitely a, uh, a number one book. Um, that's based on finance. The gist of it is, is you learn how to control your own financial situation. And this book was written... It's 100 years old now, huh? It's thousands of years old. Oh. The book is 100 years old, but... The story. The story is thousands of years old, and it's more relevant today than it ever was in the past. Wow. And the story evolves, so it goes... Um, it's broken down into... Uh, thousands of years ago, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, and 50 years ago. Oh. And the story goes and it's passed down through generation and uh, generation and it's all based on um, spending, saving more than you spend and, and develop, making your money work for you. The reason that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer is because the rich have money and the poor do not. Yeah, and, yeah. and so if the poor, if we can as a society... I don't know. No, it's, I, that's a weird phenomenon. It's like, it's even in the Bible. It's like, that who haveth cometh more. So like, for instance, like, what comes to mind is like, that stuff in the universe which has the most, which is the biggest, has the most gravity and they pull, attract more things to it so it's like the rich do get richer and the, that who doesn't have 
tends to like less tends to come. Right, absolutely. And it doesn't feel fair. It's not fair. But and the only way out of it is for the people to take back the power. And the people have to take back the power by taking action. It's not just gonna happen. And one of the action things is moving out of the cities, becoming more self-sustainable because that empowers you instead of empowering globalization. Right, but you know, I'm not saying you have to move out of the cities. This oh. is just a phenomenon that happens. I think really you just have to understand your financial order. Understand your books, try to, try to grow your own food, try to get your own food locally. That, that will bring back the power of anti-globalization. So what's a fail, a, a failure, like a parent failure? I know you've been investing now for almost a decade. It doesn't have to be investing, but what, what's a failure you had that ended up being a, a blessing? What was a... Okay, so the biggest failure I've ever had investing was not starting soon enough. <laughs> what, really? Yeah, because... But you started young, man. You started when you were like 19, 20. Yeah. Yeah, I start. It's early, It's the, the 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 lessons you learn are the failures you have. So the earlier you fail in investing, the stronger you'll understand. And I could continuously fail even today. Um, but the lessons I've learned is I I I took a lot of money and I tried ten different things. I tried flipping cars. I tried investing in dividend or you know options on the stock market. I've tried all kinds of things and I've pretty much lost all of my money many, many times. I went from having $20,000 in my bank account back to zero. And then I end up working my butt off, saving up money and trying something else and that having failed. But I finally invested in cryptocurrency and I knew it was the future and now I don't have to work anymore. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on board too. I mean. I'm playing the long game with cryptocurrency, but definitely at this point I'm a little nervous. I think it's pretty safe to say. Most people sell at the bottom because those, like you said, which is unfortunate, they end up being the losers. And I've been tempted to sell at the bottom because I'm like, shit, man, like, I better get some back instead of... Absolutely. Oh, in The Intelligent Investor, which is um, by Benjamin Graham, he was Warren Buffett's mentor. And in this book, it's called The Intelligent Investor Again. It's a classic statement of 90% of the population is always on the wrong side of the trade. And 10% is on the right side of the trade. So when the stock is overvalued, when it's gone up a lot, typically that's when 90% of the population jumps into the stock. The stock is undervalued when it drops a bunch. That's when 90% of the population sells. And the 10% that stays in at the bottom or the 10% that sells at the top that's always consistent throughout history. And that's that's the reason why you have massive drops in the price is because as it's dropping, that's when massive percentage of the population continues to, to sell and lose. So when something goes down a bunch, that's when you want to buy. Uh, yeah, counterintuitive. It, it's when, when the classic Benjamin Graham is, is you know, you want to, when, when there's a lot of fear in the market, that's when it's a good time to buy. When there's no fear in the market, uh, that's when you want to sell. So when people are saying stocks can't go, stocks are going to continue to just go through the roof, maybe that's a good time to sell. When people are saying stocks are going to continue to decline, it's maybe a good time to buy. Shit, I can see that in Bitcoin because when it was rising and everyone's like, it's going to a million, you yeah. see all those banners, that was like the end of its first peak. Yeah. So had I played, you know, had I played that right, I could have sold there and then rebought where it's at in its current state. Uh, but didn't happen that way. You learn your lesson, and the most valuable thing is the cost average. So it's always been the most successful thing to do is cost averaging is cost buying or cost averaging your purchases or your sales has always been the best option. So if you want to invest ten thousand, one thousand. $500. If you want to invest $500, start in one month or one, every two weeks, buy $100 and, and when you want to buy. So $100, $100, $100, $100. Yeah. So over time, you, you, you buy in at a stable ratio because if the market continues to go down or continues to go up, 
you kind of like hedging your bet a little bit. Absolutely. And, yeah. and same thing goes for selling. Sell a little bit, sell a little bit, uh, sell a little bit, sell a little bit. Uh, and so that way you're always going to be... You're catching, you're playing the trend as opposed to playing the day, like the, the moment. Yeah. Always been the best option. Well, we're yeah. in Mexico. Think we gotta go hit the beach? Yeah, fucking let's go. 15 minutes, perfect. Later, guys.